Uh, in case you weren't to talk this morning, Coach Fulnell wears many hats. As Corey said, uh, he is the cultural attaché at the embassy in London. He's also the president of Uripo, which is the most important and most long-standing uh, international literary movement in Europe. And he's been the president of what since what age? Six years. Okay. I should also mention that he's won a number of prestigious literary awards. Uh, let me just list a couple of them: the Renaudot des Lycéens, uh, Sport Scriptum, Grand Prix de Littérature Sportive. So these are awards for sports writing. Uh, Prix du Meilleur Livre de Jeunesse, uh, the best book for the youth. Uh, the Goncourt, which is a really prestigious award in France, de la Nouvelle. So uh, Goncourt for the short story, and there are another dozen or so. Um, why a book on cycling? Uh, like I said, for a lot of people, this might seem like a frivolous topic, especially to Americans. Uh, one might point, point out, or start out by pointing out, that cycling is a kind of religion in France and in Europe. Um, it has its gods, its rituals, its sense of brotherhood. Um, if you ride with cyclists in France, if you ride with a club, for example, the formal vous, which is de rigueur anywhere else, suddenly disappears, and you're two people, people way older than you. Um, that was quite a shock. It has its annual privilege, the Tour de France, and it has its sins. Uh, doping would be one of the most obvious ones, but if you've read uh, Besoin de Vélo or Athlète dans leur tête, um, another sin that, if you wouldn't use this terminology, but I'm translating it for the local audience, um, <laughs> is what I would call an idealization of sports, where um, people um, develop fantasies of grandeur in their sport and where they become overly competitive in the sport to the point of turning what one originally loves into an object of disgust. This happened to me with cross country, for example. I was a cross country runner in high school for four years. I didn't want to run for 10 years after that. Um, to continue with the religion metaphor, uh, the sport of cycling is practiced by the French on Sunday, right? If you cycle in France, it's normally on Sunday morning. If you go on the back streets of the country roads, I should say, around Paris, on any Sunday morning, beginning around 7 o'clock, you'll see hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands, of cyclists out in their clubs. It's an amazing sight, an amazing experience. Um, so why is this book important? Um, I think it's, I've read several books on cycling. I think it's the book that best captures its beauty, its infinite variety of sensations, its pains, its crashes, its history, and its lore. If you just read the first few pages, you get a sense of this, right? With the, the doors coming open. Um, and every cyclist has had this experience or this fear of crashing into a door that comes open on a city street. It also portrays the thoughts and memories and observation that any cyclist might have but who would never be able to render them, in my view, with such feeling and soul and absolute precision. If you've read the book in English, I think it's an excellent translation. But if you read French, you should really reread the book in, in French to get the full spectrum of cycling language, its colorful slang, and Fournel's amazingly elegant, but nearly, in my view, impossibly, uh, in, nearly impossible to translate prose. It might help to know and this bit of information comes at the end of the book, that Fournel began writing this book while he was a cultural attaché in Cairo, a place where he found it impossible to ride his bike, and where he experienced for the first time in his life what it felt to be uh, deprived of this essential experience. It was at this point that the re re reader truly understands that the book is not simply about cycling, but is a metaphor that permits Fournel to portray his childhood memories, his relations with his father, these are some of the most moving pages I think, and the intense experience of writing with friends and family, and what it means to be human. And let me just read one little paragraph, and I'll stop there. It's at the end of the book, it's in the chapter called Circles. To create a desire for something one needs is to engage in a labor of human happiness. Need is a demanding and obscure thing that defines the dependence of one person on another. To identify it and want it is to define oneself as a person. That's the secret of culture, the secret of cuisine, the secret of kindness. It's also the secret of tiny Fournel on his bike in the vast countryside 
Miraphia sleep in equilibrium on his two wheels, trying to catch his own shadow. Full for that. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here at last, I should say. And I was really disappointed a year ago that I was not able to come to travel. And I was, you know, disappointed too because I was uh, unable to recycle when it was not. And so it was terrible. You know, I, I, I really I thank you, Scott, by the way. And, and you know, um, I started cycling, um, seriously cycling. You know, what seriously cycling means, it's on two wheels. You know, cycling on four wheels does not count for cycling. So I, I started seriously cycling when I was five years old. And um, it, it was a miracle. It, it, it was an incredible miracle for me. And I was so happy. I was so happy. But I never stopped. So I decided that, you know, it's, it's always better when you are on a bicycle, it's always better to keep on pedaling. Because if you stop at some point, you can fall. So please, when you're on your bicycle, pedal. Okay? And for no answer. And so uh, I started pedaling, and cycling was uh, my father's sport. So it's uh, something that we have in the family. We have bikes, and we love them. And so I started cycling um, with my father. He was the best cycling teacher ever. Because he taught me not to race. I agree absolutely with Scott. You know, racing is the best, you know, the shortest way to, to, you know, to stop cycling. In fact, because then you hate your bike. Just something that I cannot imagine. I do not want to hate my bike. Never. I have fun, and I love them, and I don't want anyone to touch my bikes. I keep a bike every ten years. So my garage is history of bicycles. I have the 1961, when that was made by the guy who made the bicycles for Jacques Anquetil and for the likes of Raymond Fulbert and people like this. Then I have 1971, which is a beautiful steel one by Lapierre, beautiful bike. I have a carbon fiber of the 1980s. I have an um, aluminum one of the 1990s, and I have a beautiful Titanium one. This is the very last one I built in London a year ago because they know how to do titanium bikes there. And you know, titanium is something very special because it's very light and it's very comfortable at the same time. And so, please, if you want, I take orders. <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, I, I started cycling in, um, in a paradise, which is something special that we have in France. This is why we have a lot of cyclists in France, because we have a lot of little roads. You know, we have so many, so many of those little, little roads in France that are so comfortable to ride, where you can ride a couple of hours without seeing anyone, without having cars or having trucks or whatever you want on the road. From time to time, you can have goats. <laughs> I killed one once. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was in the descent, I was, I must say, I was going quite fast. So I killed the goat, <laughs> and um, it didn't kill me, but you know, almost. It killed my bike, for sure. And my bike was just crashed like that. Uh, all of a sudden, the small bike like this. Like, the wheels were just uh, like that. So that was a surprise. And um, uh, apart from that, uh, you can, you know, you can you know, bike for a couple of hours, three hours, five hours, in my Haute Loire, Haute Loire. Yeah, this is. It's there. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's a very tiny little place that, uh, it's the, the very, uh, along the river of Loire, at the very beginning of the river of Loire. It's a lovely little place. I have a lovely little village there. My father has a house there. And so I love it because it's the contrary, um, of, you know, it's the contrary of your house, for example. I, I live down in the village. So when I come back, it's always desolate. So it's very comfortable. But when I leave, it's terrible. 
It's a beautiful place. It's 400 meters high. And all around, you have those beautiful round little mountains. And so you climb up to 1,000 or 1,100 meters. And um, it's always about, you know, between 30 and 40 minutes climb, which is very comfortable. It's 7% the degree. Um, it's 7%, so it's very nice. It is paradise for cyclists. And so this is where I grew up. And this is where I started biking, behind my father. I was not allowed at that time to pass my father. He was in front. He was the one in front. I was behind, and I was learning how to pedal like this. Change gears and do whatever it takes to be a cyclist. So it took me you know, maybe two or three years. This, and then after that, forget that. <laughs> Let me rush up there and, and go with my, my friends. So I've been cycling everywhere for years. Everywhere, I say everywhere. When I was in California, I was cycling in California because I was here. Yeah, I like cycled everywhere in the Alps, Pyrenees, all the mountains, all those places like this. Uh, we had kind of a ritual every year in July. The idea was to, um, to go and see the river we call the France in the Alps or in the Pyrenees. So in the morning, early, early morning, we climbed the coil, and on top of the coil, we waited for the races just to come. We loaded, and we, we came back. That was the, uh, every, every summer it was this, because we love Tour de France. We don't know where Tour de France is. But Tour de France for French people is something so huge, so huge, it's so deeply rooted into our lives. You know, like football for you. But, yes, 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 yes. football means something for you. It's, it's, you know, it's going west and it's getting more and more territory and going to the Pacific coast. So it's, it's always the idea of gaining you know, space and, and it, it deals with your history. And cycling deals with now is the, in the same way. Why? First place, because France is a, a country that you can cycle. Very easy. It's beautiful. The landscape is changing very, very fast. You don't have to wait for hours for, to have a new landscape. The landscape is changing very fast. And it's beautiful everywhere. Tour de France is also something very important because um, in, the, in, the, in the starting at the end of the Middle Ages, Tour de France, were, were, in order to be a good worker, you had to do your Tour de France. It was very essential. And it still is what we call les compagnons du Tour de France. It's something very deeply rooted. When you want to, to, to be a carpenter, for example, you were somewhere maybe in the north of France, in Lille, you started to, to learn the job, so you wanted to be a carpenter. And then, in order to be a compagnon, in order to be a master carpenter, you had to sort of France and to go and see how people were working in the fields everywhere in the country. And it's only when you had completed your tour de France that you were able to be the compagnon du tour de France, which is something very, very important. And uh, uh, so the, the, the cyclists that are cycling France and doing the tour de France are good compagnons. They're good workers. They're doing their job. And they're doing it the hard way. So this is good for them. And then there was also something very important uh, as far as Tour de France is concerned, is that there was a book in which everybody in France was learning how to read. You know, in France it doesn't work like here. Everybody learns the same thing at the same time, everywhere in the country. And so uh, that book was very, very well known. And it was Le Tour de France par deux enfants. Par deux enfants, the Tour of France by two kids. And it was the story of a little girl, a little boy, and so they were trying the country, just discovering the different way of life between you know, Marseille on so one side and Lille on the other one, and uh, Brussels on one side and Alsace on the other one. And so it, it, it was a book which was very, very, very important for everybody in France at that time, talking about the beginning of the century. And uh, this is one of the reasons why the idea of Tour de France is so deeply rooted into our culture. And Tour de France is also something um, which is, it means summer. Tour de France is it's vacation for us. It's, it's dry, it's sunny, it's beautiful. There are flowers everywhere. And uh, it's always, every year, it's a way of revisiting our country. 
And they have, they have got that very well on TV. They know very well how to do that. They have helicopters, they have planes, they have motorbikes, they have cars, they have everything that it takes. It costs millions to do that. But it works very well. You see that everywhere in the world. So uh, the syndicate is everywhere. And so they, they know that very well. People are watching TV not for the race. A vast majority of people are watching TV for the landscapes. For the landscapes, because they want to see again, you know, the beautiful climb of the <coughs> Col de Vizoar, uh, the, the, the very strange climb of the Mont Ventoux, uh, because they are very happy with, to, to rediscover Auvergne, or to, you know, just to see Brittany and, uh, and the sea there. And so there is something that, it's, it's a kind of a large, huge mise-en-scene of our country, which is something very, very important for us. Of course, on the top of this is the race. And the race itself is, of course, the most challenging race in the world. Nothing compares to the Tour de France, not even the Tour de l'Italie, which is not a tour. You cannot talk of Italy, you know, this is... <laughs> yes, so that doesn't work. So, um, yes, it's a few years down. And so the Tour de France is really the tour. And so the race is very, very challenging. Very challenging because we have mountains in different locations. We have mountains there. We have mountain, mountains there. And we have mountains in between. So every year, it's, you have to know if we do Pyrenees first or if we do Alps first. Because the, the race will not be the same if you do Pyrenees first or if you do Alps first. So the race has not exactly the same shape. It's always um, about 3,000 kilometers, which is not so bad after all. They have to do that uh, within the 20 days frame. Usually um, in, in the middle of the Tour de France is our national day, the 14 juillet, 14th of July, which is Bastille Day. As you said, we never say Bastille Day, but you said Bastille Day. Okay. <laughs> and, um, welcome to Bastille Day. Yeah, and, um, this is, um, uh, this is usually this is the, the, the middle of the race, and this is a very important day because uh, usually French riders are very eager to win that day because this is the day. So that's a lovely race, and uh, so this is the reason why we all love Tour de France. And uh, if I, you know, at some point I, I was just, I thought of, of in fact. I thought of writing seriously at some point, but uh, I had to choose between studying and pedaling, and so now it would be different. There's money to be made out of cycling, but when I was uh, young, there was no money involved in cycling. We were pedaling for almost nothing, very, very small, very small salaries, and uh, very small prime. There was no money involved. Now it's quite different. So at that time, I choose to, uh, I choose not to compete, and uh, I choose to love my my cycling and uh, not to compete. But I would have liked so much to do the Tour de France, and my dream came true in 1996 when the newspaper in uh, France asked me to follow the Tour de France and to write every day, and um, which is something. It's not like writing. But uh, I can tell you, it's something. It's very difficult because the, the stage finishes by you know 4:30, something like that. 4:30, seven, five, five from time to time, and then you have to write your paper and to send it before seven or before eight o'clock. Last time because the, the paper is printed during the night and uh, you have to find it in the morning. So it was. I, I am not a journalist, not at all. I'm a writer, which is. Another job was a, that does not compare. And so I had to learn how to write fast. I had to learn how to write when you have 500 other people writing around you who were in kind of gymnasiums, you know, huge gymnasiums, and everybody had this little laptop. You were just like this, elbow behind it. It was a peloton. It was a peloton. You were, were exactly racing like that. So there were sprinters, <laughs> there were climbers, <laughs> and so we were just writing like that. And oh, I was just like, ching! So that was quite, um, 
quite challenging. That was, that was fun. I loved it. <coughs> but it was not a very good year for the Pulse, I must say. It was 1996, and uh, it was um, um, a big year for doping. In, uh, I, I, by the way, I do not dope. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> so I will not give you any information about that. Uh, nothing you see on us, no shots, no, no pills, nothing of that kind. But I know how it works. And it works very well. You <laughs> 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 turn you into a motorbike just like that. No. <laughs> no, that's surprising. I have a few friends uh, are doing it at this point. It's really nice. But, uh, oh yes, yes, they're very fast and they're never tired and they're very good and they just find back and just like that. And uh, on the top they can answer questions, you know. Yeah, this is amazing. Yeah. I remember once, when I was, uh, when I was a kid, I was riding with a friend of mine, Jean Bernard, and he was the one who was doing the Pulse Race. I was riding with a guy from, from Greece. He was from Greece. And he was, his, his father was coal miner. They were very, very poor. And his only hope in life was to win races in order to make a name, a small name, in a small place for you know small small money. And they wanted that. So he started taking pills and at that time it was amphetamines and the kind of things that you take now to dance. And um, so he, he was he was using this and um, I remember when they, there was a, a time trial there was a time trial, and the time trial was, uh, it, it was a loop that you had to do, and so the start line was also the, the, the end line, so you had to make a loop of 40 kilometers, and he was coming back, just like this. So he started, and all of a sudden, we had seen him, you know, maybe three minutes later, coming back, you know, just like this, and he crossed the line, and he stopped, and he said, well, I've made it well. Hmm? We were just forming. <laughs> So we had to hide him into the car for a while. He <laughs> said, no, it could have been quite compromised. So that, was it. that can happen. It's a very, very old story. You know, doping is um, some of the stories. Is, it's as old as humanity, I must say. Right? And even Greek athletes were doping, and everybody was doping. But now they are very serious at that. In total parts, and they dope a lot. And they, use very, very strong things that work very well. You can, they get a boost by at least 15 or 20 percent of their natural strength. Can you imagine? They, being 20 percent stronger than you are, 20 percent faster. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that doesn't make you 20 percent more intelligent. But that's the story. So, um, in fact, as Scott told you, I, I talked to you about Tour de France because I, I, I love it, but uh, uh, this is not at all the kind of cycling that I do. The kind of cycling that I do is uh, the one where you do not care for an extra 15 minutes. You really do not care for an extra hour. You know, I like to wait for my buddies on top of the mountains. I like them to wait for me, and uh, there's no competition involved. I really don't care. I take the time it takes, and the pleasure is in something. It's not in competing, it's not in winning, it's not in losing. Well, some people like to lose, hopefully. And, and um, the, the pleasure is elsewhere, it's in cycling. It's just taking time of, of a taste, the taste of the air, the quality of the air. I can recognize the, the quality of the air. I mean, the air in the Alps is not the same as in the Pyrenees. You know, if I put a blindfold and just put me down there, I say, uh uh, here I am. <coughs> so now I really know the air of Alta. <laughs> I will recognize the air of Alta in Sundance air. <laughs> New knowledge. And uh, I remember the grain of roads as well. Things like this, you know. I'd say, I'd, oh, that kind of road, it's, it's mountain, this one is close, much closer to Paris. You know, they're very smooth in Paris. They are not so smooth in the mountains because they they have to be quite you know, strong during winter time, and so roads are different. You can feel this into your saddle, and uh, saddle is a very interesting thing. It talks to you. 
And uh, I, so I, I like that kind of relationship with outside world. The thing is that when you travel um, in your car, for example, you, you, you look at the landscape, it's beautiful, it's part of the world, it's, it's wonderful. But when you, you cycle the world, you are into the landscape, you are part of the landscape. So you, it's, it's absolutely, it's absolutely different. Because you are into that. You are into the, the heat when it comes. You are under the rain, you get the rain, you get the wind, the wind. I hate the wind. Um, no, winds, wow. Because you cannot see it. A climb, you see a climb, so you're happy. I was there, I'm there. The wind, you were there, you were still there. <laughs> so that's, that, that, that's uh, but we have to, I, I, I had to learn the wind. You know, when I came first, first place to Paris, I was living in Saint-Étienne, and Saint-Étienne is the mountains. And so in the mountains, the wind doesn't work the same way. Because you know, it's always broken by valleys, by mountains, and so you, you never get exactly the wind. So when I came first place to Paris, we, we had that big west wind that comes from the Normandy. And um, this wind will bring north from time to time, from Brussels. And so <laughs> then you have to learn, you have to learn how to bike against the wind. And even to learn how to bike with the wind. <laughs> Which is something else because you can ride very fast for a long, long time. You're very happy, and then all of a sudden you have to turn back, and it's a tragedy <laughs> because you, you know when you were running 40 kilometers per hour, all of a sudden you turn and you are 18 kilometers, and you don't understand why. And so you say at that point you say, oh, it's going to be a long, long trip back, and it is usually. So that's that's the. Um, that's the story of um, you know the way I, I, I feel like, it. and I love animals as well. Animals are very different; they are behaving very differently when you are on the bike. I, I do not talk about the goat. Okay? The goat is something else. So. But I leave the goat. There's also the, the dog, okay? The yellow one. Okay, so you forget the dog and you forget the goat. So I kill both. I'm sorry. You know, I, from, I love animals. Really. I'm not an animal killer. No, really. Really, really. Even if you were going to eat, I would not kill an animal. I love them. But those, I had to. It was them or me. I chose me. But, you know, for the yellow dog, it was so so. I'd lost you. Bones and a lot of things, but I feel about it. And um, it was a box. And uh, I'm making one. And, and so, apart from this, uh, uh, those two, uh, um, you know, animals are, are fantastic. They love cyclists. In fact, even wild animals. I don't know. I'm sure you, you can experience this uh, around the uh, city in the mountains. But uh, I have done that in the Alps so many times. In fact, moments. Why do you do that? Looking at you like this. Let's talk about cows. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, this, this is very, this is very, very funny. I, I, I love like those, those, you know, rabbits everywhere along the road. Just you cannot see that when you are in the car. When you're in your car, you can kill them. But um, you can see them. You can kind of have a look at them. And in my little village, I have a lot of rabbits. I, I am very, they are very friendly with cyclists. So this is, you know, this is another relationship, and this is exactly what I'm trying to uh, to find um, when I when I cycle. And this is exactly what I'm trying to uh, uh, to tell in, in this book. It's, it's not at all a book about racing. It's not at all in an autobiography of the racer that we have so many of them. Some, some are very interesting. I must say that the very last one by Laurent Fignon is very interesting and very well written. It was written by a friend of mine. And um, in fact, it is a journalist. It is a good journalist. And so it writes very well. So I'd like to, um, I'd like to, to read a, a couple of pages, if you don't mind. Don't you? So that, let, let me read the, 
come back to the very beginning of this slide, that we can mirror any objection. The bike always starts with a miracle. For days you tremble, you hesitate. You tell yourself that you'll never get rid of that hand guiding you under the seat. My father and mother took turns holding onto me, as did, no doubt, one of my cousins, from whom I inherited the little bike. Whoever it was, who was in charge of my miracle. They'd taken off the tra training wheels, and I took to the field in front of our house <coughs> and followed its slope down, gaining momentum. I was looking for the magic moment that makes the duo stay up when it should go down, and I wiped out already and got up again. And then, one morning, I no longer heard the sound of someone running behind me, the sound of rhythmic breathing at my back. The miracle had taken place. I was right. I never wanted to put my feet back down for fear that the miracle wouldn't happen again. I was in seventh heaven. I did a tour around the house, proving to myself that I could do four right turns. For a number of weeks, I preferred Tommy Wright. <laughs> I was no longer afraid of anything. I rocketed past the clump of nettles that usually scared me. I rode panic-free down the long, lonely road behind the house and came out in front again in triumph, but still unable to raise my hand in the victory song. I've never gotten over that miracle. Learning to swim didn't move me like this. And it was really only learning to read that equaled the intensity of learning to ride. Within a few months, then, I learned in that order riding and reading. At the age of five, that Christmas, I had arrived. I knew what my work would be and my nature. So, that, you know, the, the kind of little text that I, I like to write about uh, things that I like, and um, um, trying to just to catch this, uh, this very minute of intensity, or this very minute of sensation, this very minuscule sensation that you can get some, some time, from time to time, from things around. And if you do not open your eyes, do not open your ears, and do not open your heart, you will never get it. But if you do, if you take the time, if you don't push too big a gear, for example, you can grab a few things here and there. Okay? Questions? Um, <clears throat> throughout your lifetime, have you witnessed a substantial change in perceptions towards biking in France? Yeah, I did. I was. Um, the only one in my class who was at the lycée. <laughs> what have I done? <laughs> so yes, of course, I was the only one to 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 do sports when I, in my lycée. You know, among intellectuals, it was a, it's so different from here. You know, it was it was absolutely ridiculous the idea of. Uh, Having sports, you know, everybody wanted not to do sports. So that was the idea of having a letter from your mother just saying that, oh, the boy is not feeling good, so do not let him go to the gym. That was the story. Uh, so it, it, and of course, things are very, very different today. And I must say that uh, I've seen more and more people coming out with their bikes. As Scott told you uh, a few minutes ago, um, Cycling around Paris on Sunday mornings, it's sketch shows the special. It's something special. Right? You have so many, so many of those people. And Valley de Chevreuse is a kind of a, it's on the southwest of Paris. And it's a very protected area. You cannot build them, you cannot build buildings. So it will be kind of always like it is. Always. Okay. So it's like that. And it was very, very. Uh, it's very well known among cyclists because it was always the end of the big races coming up to Paris. You know, the Bordeaux Paris, Tour Paris, 
le Tour de France, Pénéchus Vaille, 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 Vaille,
and we have great hills here, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, one day I was biking up to the South Fork, mm -hmm. and coming back downhill, I was going maybe 20, 25 miles an hour, and, and a deer jumped out and ran alongside of me. He was racing me for six or eight steps, and then he, I, he frightened me, actually. I slowed Who down. Who won? He won. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> because I slowed down. I was afraid he might, he might hit me. So I slowed down and he ran in front of me. Can you beat that? No, no. Oh, no. no. <laughs> and, and you know, I, 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 I bike in um, Richmond Park, um, which is um, Her Majesty's, um, Her Majesty's tags. And uh, the, the little, you know, the little ones and all that. So I, I bike, uh, but we always stop when we see one who wants to cross the road. And we just stop and watch him cross the road. <laughs> <laughs> so they don't want to compete. They have won already. Hmm? And they know. <laughs> I'll just speak up. You spoke about pleasure riding and about racing. Are there, is there much effort in France to uh, enable uh, people to commute to work? Uh, often I've enjoyed riding my bike to work and mixing commuting with uh, the pleasure of riding. You know, the, the best idea that we had in France these last years is the Vélib. We were talking about this uh, for lunch. You know, the Vélib, those are those bikes that you can just take in Paris. You go wherever you want, you leave them there, and then you go, you do whatever you have to do, and then you pick up another one, and you go back when you want to go. This is the best ever thing. You know, this is the best idea ever. This is very simple, this is very cheap, this is very intelligent, and it works very, very well. That's it. Too bad people are trying to destroy some of those button bicycles, maybe 15%. They have found one down in Australia. <laughs> So um, it sounds like you have some pretty awesome bikes in your collection, some from, from some of the great French constructors. Um, well, there's from English. Yeah. <laughs> um, so my question is: is um, do you think that this lack of uh, the, the idea of pleasure riding, I think that we're seeing more in cycling, do you think it has to do? It seems as though bikes over the years have kind of been losing their soul um, and become more of just a machine of of burden, more machine of sport. Machine of pleasure. Um, do you see that correlation at all? No, you know, uh, everybody has a different soul, and um, being a racer is something very really interesting too. And some people are made for that, they are built for this, and they maybe they have been made for this by people around, I don't know. And uh, they love that, and of course, you know, the history of, uh, of cycling. And, Racing is a, is a beautiful history too, and those guys are very, very strong, and they're pretty fantastic ones. Sometimes a little too fantastic, but uh, uh, but this is it. And so it's another it's another way of doing things. But the result um, is um, it's almost the same for every of those guys. Is that they are absolutely disgusted by their bikes. Now, uh, look at some, someone like Jacques Anquetil, who was one of the best riders, the most beautiful rider ever. That guy was made really to cycle. He was made for that. He was so elegant. He was so beautiful on, this, on the bike. It was incredible. But he stopped biking when he was 30, 32, 33 years old, and he never, he never touched the bike again. Which is kind of a shame, because I'm sure that at some point he would have liked that. And uh, it's the same for almost all the riders. I've seen that Bernardino was just about to, to cycle again. But then it's very difficult because when you have been the champion, one day I biked with Louis Bobet. Louis Bobet was the big French rider in the 50s. And uh, when I was a kid, and at some point, I don't know where, I don't know why, but I was riding. There was Louis Bobet and his brother Jean. He was retired at that time. But you know, everybody was trying to compete with him. He, he, he simply wanted to, to, to cycle with his brother, just have a good time. Just in, in Paris, it was very chivalrous. It was really impossible for him. Everybody was, oh wow, it's Bobet. <laughs> so he was fed up with that. And uh, it's very difficult to, um, you know, to be a big, big, big champ and then to have to come back. So usually they change, they play golf. <laughs> Uh, 
I am. I work in the bike industry. I work with Interbike, actually, a trade show. What, 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 what kind of frame do you do? Is it the carbon fiber? Or? Uh, Interbike? No, it's just a trade show. We work with some other bike component manufacturers. But my question is, how do you see what is keeping the United States from really needing the bike? We've, we've kind of noticed in the, in the trade portion of things, um, manufacturers trying to be more inclusive of different audiences, women and different ages, and um, different uses of the bike, transportation, sport. How, what do you see keeping the United States from needing a bike like European countries do? Well, I, I think it's a mix of different things. The first thing is victory. Obviously, you're a country that works very well with victory. And um, people like the American riders, and uh, so that they've done, they've done a lot for uh, cycling in America, for sure. Uh, but there is something else, which is uh, keeping oneself healthy. It's a lovely way of aging. And you can cycle very late. If you go your way, if you go your speed, you can cycle very late. You can do very comfortable rides, uh, even if you are 70 years old, or 75 years old. That's for today. And uh, no, tomorrow. Uh, and, um, and, and this is it. Uh, I think that, isn't that enough? Or would you like more? Is there something more that you think of? Or? Oh, um, no, I was just wondering, like, culturally, what sort of, what might be blocking you? Americans. No, but, but American are not blocked. <laughs> what do you think about that? I shouldn't say this. We were yesterday. We were cycling. <laughs> <laughs> the snow. We have snow on the road. We were cycling. Okay, not blocked. I've met some of the guys here. We were cycling like that. <laughs> <laughs> no, they're not blocked. Oh, they of course, it's not China. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody's not cycling in China. Yeah. Yeah. Of course, it's not China. Everybody's not cycling because it's not compulsory, but today it is. It's fine. No, no, I, I don't think you're blocked at all. The good cyclists, very good. And I can see a lot of cyclists everywhere doing well. Of course, you know, it's difficult to cycle in Manhattan, for example. It's not the best idea. Los Angeles is not exactly made for that. We are lucky in France. We cannot use hammers, but we can use bikes. <laughs> we have small groups. That's the big difference. Try to pedal a hammer. Um, I I haven't had a bike, I think, since I was twelve. I grew really fast when I was little and then I grew out my bike really fast when I never got a new one. So I was thinking about buying a bike. So I was just wondering, like for you, like what makes a good bike? Like how do you pick one out for you? Like I change every two or three years, so <laughs> uh, of course I don't know what is a good bike that I will not change. Uh, I, I don't know, it depends on what you want to do with it. Mm -hmm. like, if it's to go to the university and just to commute and take mud guards and to take a very comfortable bike and just to sing along. That's fine. If you want to race, that's different. But here in America, you have beautiful bikes these days, but you can buy the little truck and feel like Lance Armstrong. <laughs> it, depends, you know, it depends on so many things. There are so many different kinds of bikes now. You can have a mountain bike, you can have you know, city bikes, you can have bikes for 1,000, you can have bikes for 10,000, you can have bikes for 500. I have used one for nothing. And um, you know, I, I couldn't help you, I'm sorry. <laughs> Unless you send me an email just describing exactly what are the plans. <laughs> what you plan to do. And I'm sure that uh, the day you have to buy it, which is absolutely appropriate to the plans, you will change the plans. It's <laughs> one of your favorite big pleasures in cycling, and I have learned that in years, is changing the Having a new life. It's like having a new life. You your life. Ah, it's beautiful. <laughs> but then you, you like more. Uh, it's, you have to change from time to time. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.